building this new 21st century organization is to build an organization where each and every individual has line of sight to customers and understands what their customers want and knows when they deliver that. The second key principle here, the first pillar in this Parthenon we're building, is to use knowledge, emphasis on the word knowledge, to build true customer partnerships. When you go back and look at how we use knowledge, we use knowledge to help our customers succeed. And that's what that little graphic is intended to display. Now, when we have a partnership, a true partnership with a customer, we have a set of shared values where we all are on the same page. We have aligned with our customers, our purposes with theirs, and our visions with theirs. And most importantly of all, we share the ownership for implementation of whatever it is that we agree to. It is that sharing of responsibility for execution that really distinguishes partnerships from all other kinds of activities. It's a great book written, written here by Richard Whiteley. And this quote's in that book. And the key words here are trust and candor. It says that we tell our partners everything and that we trust our partners with that knowledge that we trust the partners will help us succeed. The key here is to use knowledge as a way to transform a traditional buyer-seller relationship into a partner relationship. And it's a certain kind of knowledge. It's knowledge about the industry within which the customer works. It's knowledge in depth about the customer itself. It's knowledge about the opportunities out there in the marketplace and then most critically of all, it's knowledge about how to make those opportunities really work. Richard Whiteley, the quote again, is to really get to know your customers even better than they know themselves. So you really need to learn how to become customer experts. Experts in what your customers really want and really need. It's only by becoming experts that you can help to climb the partnership pyramid. You see, knowledge of products and services and even solutions only gains you competitive parity. To get a true value differentiation, to get a true value margin, which is above competitive margins, you really need to build on in-depth knowledge of the industry and the customer because that's what's going to differentiate you from all of your other competitors. Get to know your customer better than your customer knows itself. We have a case study included in your material and we're going to turn to that case study in just a minute. The principle underlying this case study is to really look at not only your customer but also to look at your customer's customer by answering the, by answering the fundamental question how does your customer win in their market? If you'll turn to pages 82 and 83 in your appendix, you'll see the beginning of this case study, and let me walk you through some of the examples. This is a real case. It's a case that I worked on in 1990, from 1990 until the present. And there are four steps in this process. The first step is to look at worksheet number A, where, where we went to the senior leadership of this $10 billion consumer products company, they are world known. They are cited frequently as a well-managed global organization. Tom Peters, for instance, has included them many times in his writings. They recently won an award for one of the best managed companies in America. They are well known. You have their products in your home today. We went to the senior leadership of this organization and asked them, how do you define winning in your market? Look at pages 82 to 83 in your appendix. You'll see what their answer was. These are pretty standard stuff. Increase profitability, grow our market share, and so on. We then ask them, what are the issues that confront you? What are the things that truly get you up at 2 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat to walk the floor? What are the knots in your stomach that really cause you concern? And these are the answers they gave, once again, 82, 83, on worksheet B. And you can see here what it is. 
increasing customer segmentation. We used to make one product in our brand. Now we have several hundreds. We probably need several thousands because there, th there are that many different customer segments out there. Our retail customers are all over us to change. Efficient customer response, ECR, is a major demand. We have to reinvent the way we supply them, and so on and so on. These are the issues that keep them up at night. If you'll turn to pages 84 to 85, you'll see a very important worksheet, because we did this together with this customer. We asked them first, what are the measures by which you would measure success in your business? And so that's, that's where they gave us inventory turns, percent of service levels fulfilled, and so on. Then we asked them, how good a job are you doing against those measures? And that's what the third column over is. Ten inventory turns a year and so on. Then we went out and we did some research. And we found the best competitors for each one of those areas and found what they were doing. Now, that, that best competitor is a composite. It's not the same competitor. It is a composite of best in class across all competitors. This is a very powerful piece of information, ladies and gentlemen. When you go back and look at just take the first line as an example. They turn their inventory ten times a year, which means that they roughly have at any, at any one point in time about a billion dollars tied up in inventory. Their best-in-class in competitor is turning their inventory 20 times a year. That means that if, the, if, if they were, in fact, $10 billion, they would have only $500 million tied up. When you look across the table at the chairman of this organization and say, Mr. Chairman, how would you like to have $500 million more million to invest in your growth? His first answer is, where do I sign? Because on this chart, on chart C here, there's over $900 million of lost profit opportunity that this organization, a well-managed, well-respected global organization, is leaving on the table that they, of which they were not aware. This research helped them to see areas in which they needed to improve. Based upon that, we went back and asked, okay, what do we together, you, ABC Packaging, and us, what do we together need to learn? And that's what Worksheet D talks about. Lean more, we have to learn more about database marketing. We have to learn more about inventory management systems. We don't know that very well. And we have to learn how to manage and change our organization. And what did they do? If you turn to page 86 and 87, you'll see what they did beginning in the latter half of, I'm sorry, in the first half of 1991. Three major issues. They reinvented their supply chain, and you see the steps they took to do that. They introduced a whole set of target marketing activities and you can see the steps it took to do that and then they went through the same kind of process that we're doing right here and now that I'm explaining right here and now to you look at pages 88 to 89 and you'll see the results the results are truly outstanding for instance they went from turning their inventory ten times a year to turning their inventory now where they are the world class the best in their business at doing it a, a world class 23 times all told on this page, 88-89, there's $1.4 billion of additional revenue, additional profit, that this organization realized. In 1994, this was a $16 billion business. It was the most profitable business in its industry. And now you understand the reason why. They use knowledge, we and they, we as their supplier, they as our customer. We use knowledge to help them improve their operations. That's what using knowledge to build partnerships is all about. Critical step number two, use knowledge to build true customer partnerships where you work shoulder to shoulder with that, with that organization to help them improve. The third critical step is to now go back and to build an organizational infrastructure that will help you focus on knowledge. And this organizational infrastructure includes both systems and structures. Let's look, if we can, first at the systems that have to change. We need to learn how to manage in a very different way, both using our systems and our structures to do that. Most of us are very good at managing vertically, managing upward. You see, most organizations are built like Christmas trees. And it's very clear that the star on the top of the Christmas tree 
is the major power. We have been trained very well to look up, to look this way. I suggest that what we need to do is to learn how to train ourselves and our people to look this way, to look horizontally, to build an organization where the customer is the boss and the boss isn't the boss. Let me give you a little personal example, if I may. In my organization, as many of you who were here before know, in my organization, in the, in the inventory control for hazardous and toxic material, we have built a very successful business. Every paycheck for every person in that organization is countersigned by two people. It's signed, by, it's, it's signed first by a company representative, but then it is signed by that person's major customer. That's a very American kind of approach. A little hokey, perhaps, all right? And it's not something I'm going to go recommend. It may be too Californian, all right? But the message that we want to send in our organization is very clear. The real boss in this organization is the customer out here, not the boss up here. Critical thing. Let's look, if we can, at the systems, at how we in re redesign the plumbing to make the plumbing work so that we get the stuff in the right place. Three critical systems. The first one are objectives. We need to set objectives continuously with customers. That means if you're my customer, I need to meet continuously with you to decide what you really need. And we need to make an agreement between us about what you really need and what I'm going to do to help you achieve what you need to achieve. And then we need to interlock. If I need some people inside my organization, we need to interlock together so that we can together supply you what you really need. That means these objectives need to be set on a continuous basis rather than once a year. They need to be set with customers rather than set with bosses. And need to be set on an ongoing basis. Objectives set with customers. Then, if you are my customer, I need to have ongoing direct feedback from you in a real-time basis about how well I'm doing. I need to know right now whether I'm... I'm reaching you whether this is the information you need, whether these are the products and services you really want. You are inevitably going to ask me for things that aren't in the book, things that are a little different. Every customer does. Rather than having to have a whole series of meetings and contact my boss and contact a bunch of other people, I need to have at my disposal information that tells me whether I can do what you want financially whether it's possible to even do in a product sense, whether it's even possible to do in a delivery sense. I need to have a transparent information system that tells me on a real-time basis exactly what I need to know so I can make a decision for you, my customer, either face-to-face -face or on the telephone. And the third piece about this feedback system I need to have, if I am your boss and you work for me, you are in the best position to know how good a supervisor I am. So therefore, if I want to know how good a supervisor I am, the person I should come and ask is you. That means that I need feedback from you, upward feedback from you, on a real-time basis about how good a job I'm doing. The second key system we need is a measurement system that is linked directly with customers that provides transparent information to me so I can make decisions on a real-time basis and that provides feedback from the people I lead that tells me how good a leader I am. The third critical thing we need to have is a reward system. A reward system that's based on the full value equation. That's based upon paying people not just for making profits, but also paying people, as an example, for customer success. And also paying people based upon employee productivity and success. It needs to be based upon full stream performance. Not allocation performance, but full stream real performance. These to be based upon competitive benchmarks. How do we really stack up against other people doing similar work? We could be getting better, but if our competitors are getting better faster, they are in fact widening the distance between us and we are not narrowing the gap. So we need to have a reward system, which includes, by the way, both uh, both financial rewards as well as non-financial rewards. So we need to have a reward system that's based upon all of these items. 
objectives, measures, and rewards. We need to have those systems need to be in place if we're going to build an organization that manages horizontally rather than manages vertically. Now we have to change the organization structure. The structure's got to be different. So we need to build an organization where the customer is in the middle and the rest of us are in a circle or network around them. What this means is we need to build an organization rather than as a hierarchy, build the organization as organized around customers. Most organizations today are built around the way work is done. So we have an engineering department, we have a finance department, we have a sales department. The, the nature of the organization is built on the basis of the work people do. I'd like to propose that in the 21st century organization, we will be organized around the customers we serve. And the customer focus team will be the basic building block for the organization. And in that customer focus team, we will bring all the resources that we need to that particular interface. So we will have a member of, an, who, a person who's skilled in engineering. We will have a person who's skilled in finance. We will have a person who's skilled in sales. But rather than working in a sales or engineering or finance department, they will be working as part of a customer focus team where their lives are inevitably linked with the success of their given customer, not with how good an accountant they are or how good an engineer they are. This means that we develop an entirely different kind of organizational hierarchy. And we have no more than a two-step decision cycle. What this fundamentally means is that the CFT, or Customer Focus Team, is the, is the team that makes most of the decisions. 70 to 75 percent of decisions should be made by at the customer focus team level in direct contact with the customer. When they have an administrative issue that goes beyond their particular customer focus, they go to the area coach, which is the next person up the hierarchy, to handle that. When they have a functional issue, like for instance product design, or perhaps a legal issue, or perhaps a finance issue, they go to the center of excellence, and that's what COE stands for, the center of excellence in that particular function or discipline to get the answer. But the critical point here is you redesign the organization around the customer, and then you strip away the rest of the non-value-added activities to focus specifically on the customer. The third critical point here is we need to build an organization which is focused on knowledge creation and knowledge application for the benefit of the customer. The fourth key to this little Parthenon we're building is the roof line that ties it all together and this is the interlock performance agreement process. And this is how, and this, is how this process looks. We begin by defining team or company objectives based around what our customers need. We then, we then develop individual objectives. Here's what I have to do in order to help you, us as a team, succeed. Then we build personal learning development objectives which help us to learn so we can do a better job of doing what we, our team needs and our customer needs. And then we put in place a disciplined, short-stroke, 30-day action cycle plan, which enables us to truly focus on what it is that we are really going to do. All of this is regulated by 360-degree feedback. The process underlying all of this is a very different thought process, a very different conceptual process. You see, most organizations begin this, this cycle called strategic planning by doing a SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threat analysis, which essentially looks at today and manages forward from today. I'd like to propose that we need to think in a very different way. That rather than beginning from today, we need to begin from what we must be for our customers in the future, and then manage backwards from that. It is thinking strategically that makes all the difference. And that's the key element, the key concept underlying and why, this and why this whole process of thinking strategically is so central to the Interlock Performance Agreement Management System. It's this process of starting from tomorrow 
and managing backwards to today that makes the difference. Now I've talked in terms of customers as being plural because in fact we do have a great number of customers. And as you can see on your screen, we have at least these five different sets of customers and many, many more. Our task, our challenge as the leaders of our organization is to truly put in place actions and plans that will create success for all of these customers simultaneously. It is to escape the box of either or and talk about and and. Now this process really, really involves two separate kinds of activities. And what I'd like to show on the screen here, there are two critical things to really, uh, that I'd like to have you get as you're looking at this graphic. The first is, we have really, well, we have our two eggs, those are the two oval shapes, and then let's say we have two sausages up there, right? Sort of a typical American breakfast, right? When, we, when you think about this process, this process is both horizontal and vertical. So within the two eggs, let's say one egg is engineering and one egg is sales, within the ten people in engineering, they have an agreement among themselves of what they must do to create success for their customers. At the same time, in the egg called sales, those ten folks, they have an interlock performance agreement about what they must, do to, they must do to create success for their customers. At the same time, when dealing with an individual customer, certain people from engineering and certain people from sales will work together to put together an ad hoc team, which will, which will then talk about what they must do to create success for their customers. Number one, the process is both horizontal and vertical throughout the organization. But then number two, the process is all built around creating success for customers. And that's the critical key. It's all built around customers. So it's not internally focused, it is all externally focused, and that's the critical difference. Two fundamental processes. The first step is we look at a team and say, what must we do in order to create success for our team? In order to success for our customers, rather. What must we do in order to create success for our customers? And then the second process is, what do we need from each team member so we can, in fact, succeed? If you will look at, you know, onto page 92 and 93 of your, of your worksheet, you will see what this interlock planning worksheet looks like. Now, I am personally opposed to paper, I need to tell you. I don't like paper, I don't like forms. I don't like killing the trees that have to go into making these forms. What I've discovered, however, is that these, this structure provides a useful way for people to work on an ongoing basis. That's why I put this together. More than 200 organizations that I know of are using this process today. Organizations as diverse as AT&T, as the World Dutch Shell Organization, and as the United States Federal Government. All are using this kind of approach as well as my own organization, as well as my partner Ralph Stairs' organization in Johnsonville Sausage. In fact, if you look at pages 94 and 95, you'll see the first example of what a team uh, interlock performance agreement looks like. This is the financial services team from Johnsonville. You can go down and look at this is what this team published to all the members of Johnsonville, about 1,200 people strong. It's about a $200 million a year organization making sausages, that this is what they said, these three items are what they said are the three most important things they must deliver to their customers in the April to September 1994 time period. If you look at pages 98 to 99, you'll see the same thing for a breakfast line. The, this is a set of manufacturing folks. They make their living working in a refrigerator, literally in a refrigerator, stuffing sausage for a living. And this is what they say are the important things they must do in order to create success for their customers in the same time period. And then look at 96 and 97, and you'll see here is an individual member of a team. This is Michael Garvey, who's, uh, who's, who's a leader of, he's the controller of Johnsonville, and he is the coach of, coach of the financial services team. And these are what he and his teammates have agreed are the three most important things he must do in order to create success for his financial services team. So all of these are examples that you might use, and maybe you want to ask some questions about them as we move through, all right? 
The Interlock Performance Agreement process is a methodology for getting people to talk about, to have a dialogue about what are the important things we must do to create success for our customers and what do we need from each other so we can do our important work for our customers. Now, if you're not keeping score, you're not playing the game. So scores, so keeping score is very important. We absolutely, we absolutely need to keep track of a set of measurements in terms of what we really want to do, what we really want people to do, because that what gets measured gets produced. When you think about the measurement process, as an example, the measurement process should include not only financial data, it should include not only information that comes from customers and employees, but it absolutely needs to include direct, focused, personalized feedback that comes to you from the individual members of your organization. In my company, as an example, 2,412 people every month have the responsibility to give Jim Velasco feedback on how good a job he's doing at creating success in his business. In Ralph Stair's organization, 1,200 people have the responsibility every quarter to give him feedback on how good a job he's doing to create success for his organization. These measurements need to be reduced to a scoreboard. That scoreboard needs to include measures of both, of all, customers, measures from employees, measures from the financial results you're getting, and then most importantly of all, measures against how well we are truly doing against our competitive benchmarks. All four of those items must appear on the scoreboard. And then there are, in your, in your appendix, a set of specific examples for sales and service, for product realization or manufacturing kinds of organizations, and for, and for administrative kinds of tasks, all of which reflect those four key items which must be part of every measurement system. In addition to the measurement process, there needs to be a learning plan because we need to make personal knowledge as a, person, as a core, company, core competency, not just for our business, but also for each and every individual in the organization. In fact, if you will look at pages 100 to 101, you will see an example of one such learning plan from, once again, from Michael Garvey. And you'll see again that what he talks about here is acquiring certain skills, developing a certain knowledge, and then becoming a benchmarking subject matter expert. That's what SME means, subject matter expert. And, and these are the skills that he and his team have agreed he needs to, he needs to develop. These are the actions and time frames in which he's going to develop them. And these are the measures against which that's going to be judged. And at Johnsonville, at least, the achievement of this plan, which he's agreed with his co-workers, becomes a condition of his participation in the bonus plan every month. Now, all of this only works when you actually bring it all back and have it be part and parcel of an ongoing action plan. So if you look at the graphic on the screen, we are now down at the lower left-hand side at the 30-day action plan process because that's, in essence, where we need to be. What I discovered through very hard and very bitter experience is that the first three items, team objectives, individual objectives, and, and individual learning plans, are wonderful planning exercises. But if there isn't a discipline that says every short stroke of time, I've got to stand in front of my people and say, this is what I have done, and this is what I have accomplished, and this is what I must accomplish in the coming month, and I get held accountable. You see, we talk a lot about rewards. I think the most powerful reward of all is reward of personal pride, is reward of knowing that I deliver on what it is that I really promise, on, and knowing that what I do is valued by the people with whom I work and whom I serve. It is that knowledge which gives rise to pride, which I think is a major motivator. That's why this 30-day action cycle is so very important. So in my organization, as an example, every 30 days we fill out these forms. In Ralph Stair's organization, we do the same thing. In many units of AT&T, we do exactly the same thing. In many units of the Royal Dutch Shell organization, we do exactly the same thing. And in many agencies of the federal government, we do exactly the same thing. If you will now go back and look at a couple of examples, pages 104 to 105 are 
what Michael Garvey said. These are his actions for the month of May 1994. The first three items, action, purpose, and measure, those are turned in at the beginning of May. Then at the end of May, he fills in the results and he fills in his learning. May I make just two interesting observations about on this, on this sheet? One of his actions, he said, was to hold a GP, that's great performance or a partnership discussion with Bilo, that's a supermarket customer of Johnsonville. So that a finance individual is also part of a customer-focused team making calls on customers. Notice, if you will, what he said he learned. He said there are serious business issues facing Bilo. And here's the critical thing, we can help them succeed. We are small, a very small commodity supplier. We are able to help this very large supermarket customer of ours deal with their financial issues. Critical, critical observation, I think, and critical, critical piece of learning. And this is shared throughout the entire organization. Team objectives, individual objectives, learning plans, and then what am I doing this month to make those things happen? Critical discipline in an organization. Up front, I said that we need to have more clarity about where we are going, and I need more control over how I will get there. Both of these, clarity and control, are enabled by this performance interlock agreement process. Both of these critical precursors to change are, in, are, are helped by this performance interlock process. I also said up front that we need to know more about our customers. And that's, in essence, what all of this happens as a result of this process. Granular knowledge, knowing knowledge at a very small and very fine level, I believe as we go forward into the 21st century, will be the key competitive advantage. Knowing who our competitors are, and knowing who our customers are, are, who buys what from whom, with what use. Knowing what our market's going on, knowing what's going on in our marketplaces out there. What's really happening, both today and tomorrow. And then looking inside and knowing what our profitability is, and knowing who's contributing what. This granular knowledge, I think, becomes the grist for the mill. These are the building blocks. This is the sand and gravel that will build our Acropolis, uh, or, I'm sorry, that will build our Parthenon on the Acropolis that will last for the 2,000 years that that building lasted. What I have discovered through my own, both my own experience and my research, is that when you take this granular knowledge, and you give it to people so that and they can participate in the application and use of this knowledge that they have a real time real life participation in this in using this knowledge to create success for themselves and their customers that that's when you get true commitment and true ownership in the organization of the 21st century ladies and gentlemen the organizations that generate that commitment and that sense of ownership are the organizations that will thrive and prosper. The rest of the organizations, unfortunately the vast majority of them, will disappear from view. I certainly hope that yours will be one of the organizations that thrives and prospers in the 21st century. Thank you very much, Dr. Velasco. Now we are going to take our second sec uh, question and answer session. And first, we're going to take some facts questions. The first one is coming from KTV Communications from Sao Paulo, Brazil. And this is the guy who's 25 years old, and I work within a large you know, international company of electronic devices and appliances. I am the sales chief, he says, of a new department, and I would like to know how to deal with the conflict of generations when you raise this issue of empowerment. My superiors are more or less 30 years older than me, and they seem to block these new ideas. Could you suggest a new approach that I could use? I certainly understand the difficulty, and it's, and it's, not, and it's not only intergenerational, but I certainly understand how it, uh, how it seems to be intergenerational. I think the critical issue here is, is that your task needs to be to do two things, I'd urge. 
Number one is, I urge you to go out and to really gather data from your customers about what they need, about what they are going to need in the coming, in the coming years. Use the four key tools we talked about previously. Go out and really form partnerships and understand what your customers really want. Based upon those partnerships, bring that information and that data, that knowledge back to your organization and use that as the powerful persuasive arguments about the changes that need to be made. First thing is manage from the customer in. Second piece of advice I'd urge is that you use the interlock performance agreement process as a way to form agreements one-on-one -on -one with all of the people who work within your organization. And based upon those agreements, organized around what we must do to create success for our customers and what I need from you and what you need from me so we can both be successful in doing that. Use the interlock performance agreement process to bring the voice of the customer into the day-to-day -day lives of the organization. I have found, regardless of age and regardless of level, the critical issue is everyone wants to succeed. Everyone wants to get and keep customers. If you can make clear what that requires of me and of you, I think you can, regardless of your age and even regardless of your level in the organization, I think you can succeed and your organization can also succeed. The next question is coming from the Ibero-American University, Mexico. Could you suggest other ways to find out the tastes or preferences of our clients, why they buy and how we can know them better? I think there are two basic ways, and they're both really very simple. One is that most, most organizations have buried in their files, mostly computer files, exactly what their customers want. If you are a supermarket organization example, you have excellent data based upon the, uh, the stuff that's sold and about who's bought it going through your point of sale cash register each and every day. That data is buried in your organization. You need to go out and plumb it and find it. Today we have the Today we have the computer technology which enables us to analyze our computer file, our, our customer computer files. First critical issue is we probably know more than we think we do. Find it in our information and use that. And if you want to know how to do that, I'd be happy to answer that. Fax the question in here, be happy to answer it for you, okay? The second critical thing is customers will tell you a great deal if only we'd ask. I mean, customers are more than willing to tell you. And I think if you go and ask customers what really is on their minds, go back and look at the case we just talked about, we found out what the customers wanted, how they defined winning in their organization, what they defined as the critical issues in their organization. We found it out by going and asking them. There's a third critical thing you might look at, and that is that oftentimes we can go back and look at published documents. If you're dealing with a publicly traded organization, as an example, there's a, in, in the front of every annual report, there's a published statement from the chairman that says, this is what I think the issues are in my organization. They are wonderful documents. You can go back and do a, a search of the, of the newspaper reports, a, a, a search of what, the, of what the news people are saying about that organization. That's another thing you can go do. There's published information. There's individual information you get from talking to the people, and then there's all, the, all that data in your files. All three of those are ways you can go find. If you want more specific, a more specific answer, that's pretty general. If you want a more specific answer, please give me a call or please fax something in. Be happy to send it to you offline. And reiterating what Dr. Velasco has just said, those questions that we have not been able to answer now, you may go ahead and ask them, send them out via fax, and Dr. Velasco will very, very happy, will be very happy to answer them and send them over to you by mail. We have another question coming from Panama, from Veraguas, Panama. I understand that empowerment is a collectivization of power, making power collective. But there's a problem. Um, the management must want it, and the groups or work, uh, team works must be aware of that and create a consciousness in that respect. And so how can we really have this when there is no awareness, there is no teamwork and no communication? 
Well, empowerment truly means, I mean, if you want to think of it in one way, empowerment truly means moving the decision-making responsibility in an organization down to the lowest practical level. It really means getting the answer, getting the people at the front level to make the decision as soon as possible. I think the way to create the sense of urgency in having to do this faster is to go back to what we talked about in the first module. Talk about our customers who are different, talk about how our competitors are doing things differently, and then get